Thank you very much, and I hope, uh, hope everybody can hear okay. I've got two different speaker things going here. Um, it's interesting, uh, fortunately, I was here this, this afternoon to hear uh, Dr. Field a little bit uh, because uh, uh, he and I have a history uh, together. Um, in our past, we, we had a, a similar employer. Uh, there was a period of time that both of us worked for the uh, National Cattlemen's Association, or NCBA. And uh, the reason I mention that is that I'm going to warn you, some of these things that I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes um, somewhat replicate some of the thoughts that he had. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, I do fit into his definition of uh, uh, an old grouchy bastard. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not 60, but I'm climbing up, getting closer and closer. And actually, Tom and I are good enough friends that I thought maybe he was actually talking about me. Um, the other thing he mentioned, and I thought I got a little bit of a kick out of it, was um, um, apps on your phone. And I don't know if he threw a number up there, maybe 32 or some number, big old number. Like, you know how many apps I have on my phone? I have two. Because <laughs> I'm a grouchy old bastard and I don't know how to run any more than two. And, and actually, both of them are weather related. So, you know, that just shows you how simple I am. Um, I, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit today uh, when Bob asked if I would come up here and visit with you about um, uh, sort of the beef industry in 2030. Wow, what a challenge. And I'm humbled to take on such a topic. Um, I don't profess to be an expert by any means. Um, I'm no more or less than a cattle feeder. Uh, but I think what we are trying to do in our business um, takes what we think is a uh, legitimate perspective business strategy and actually applying them. Uh, we have made many mistakes. Uh, I tell many that, that I have bloodied my nose a lot of times and I have a lot of tracks on my back where we have tried things because we have tried to get in front, we've tried to be proactive, and many times we weren't correct. But I think that's part of, uh, of our company and our, uh, where we are today, um, being, being able to have a sustainable business model um, because we're not afraid to take chances. And, and we do take risks. We take lots of risks. And I'll share with you some of those, and I'll share with you our business model. And not that I'm trying to um, boast about it at all. It works for us. I'm not trying to sell it. I'm not trying it to tell you that it is the answer. But I think maybe if you can pick up a nugget or two out of what we've tried and what we continue to try, then your time and my time this afternoon have been worthwhile. Um, the Beef Marketing Group, uh, it was mentioned when I was introduced. Uh, our locations is uh, in Kansas and Nebraska. And um, this picture, you could see that I tried to be polite to Nebraska and color them red and, uh, and purple for Kansas, but we started uh, in central Kansas, and these dots represent our feed yards. So we actually have 18 feed yards. When I was introduced, it was 19, but that's because we have two feed yards that are really close together, and we call them one. But we have uh, 18 feed yards, and they're represented by the dots. Now, what's important about this slide, and it, it will help, I think, resonate a message I'm going to try to make over the next few minutes, the stars represent where we harvest our cattle. So in the beef marketing group, we are aligned with one packer. So all of our cattle go to one packer. And you're going to hear me talk a little bit about alignment in terms of where we think uh, the industry needs to go. And you're going to hear me talk about where we have gaps in that alignment. But as far as we are concerned, being in the feed yard sector, this has been a very interesting and dynamic um, structural change for us. And, and it really has allowed us to look at things uh, beyond just feeding cattle. And I'll talk to you about what I mean specifically as we, as we explore further alignment. So this is a little picture. I tried to emulate our business model in a graphic form. And I'll, I'll just kind of, I'm going to tell you a story or two as I go through this. But if you look in the center there, that is, that box sort of represents us. As a cooperative, 
and that's what we are. So we are a bunch of independent family operations that essentially have come together to work together to create value to market our cattle. But we're also big farmers. Each one of our operations has a pretty large footprint. I showed you those dots, those are the feeding operations. If I showed you the farming operations, it would be much larger. The reason we're farmers is not because we want to fit under this umbrella of sustainability. The reason we're farmers is because it's efficient. It's efficient. Our core competency is feeding cattle. But to do that, we have to capture every ounce of efficiency that we can on either side of our place in the beef value chain. The, the, the graphic up there on, the, on, on your right shows it sort of that we are farmers and we're big into, into crop production. But there's also a box there that says ethanol. Little quick story. We, seven years ago in central Kansas, we were not competitive feeding cattle because we didn't have ready access to a feedstuff that was really new to our industry, distiller's grains. We had access to it, but we had to bring it from a long ways away. And any of you know anything about distiller's grains, it's heavy. And you don't want to haul it very much. It takes a lot of diesel to move it around. So what we did, there were some smart guys that, that are part of the beef marketing group and said, you know what, if we want that feed, maybe we should figure out a way to better understand the ethanol business. Long story short, we built an ethanol plant, a legitimate one, a 60 million gallon ethanol plant. Now that sounds wonderful, costs a lot of damn money, and we don't know anything about ethanol. This is a disruptor. Tom talked about disruptors. But we knew a lot, we know, we think we know a lot about feeding cattle, and we needed that distiller's grain product to be competitive from a feed standpoint. So we cut a deal with a business company, and we provided the capital to build an ethanol plant. And our objective, we could care less about ethanol, truly. And in fact, there's some policy that we don't agree with necessarily relative to ethanol production. But our objective was the co-product that comes out of there. So now, uh, this morning I was actually at one of our feed yards. I got another story to tell you about a lobbyist that I took around to uh, see our feed yards uh, this morning. And we take 85% uh, of all the distiller's product out of that ethanol plant. And it has allowed us to make our feed much more competitive from a cost standpoint. So just a story about, about why we are, are in the farming business. The other piece of that chart that you'll see that is really where the co-ops I spend most of my time is actually on the other side of the packing plant. Really trying to understand what happens to our product once it's disassembled. Because we feel like that that is where the value is. If we understand the customer and the customer's customer, all of a sudden we have an opportunity to get out of this commodity marketplace which I can be argued with and I can be wrong, I don't think commodity cattle feeding has a long-term future. The definition of commodity, right, is a zero-sum game. Would you be in business and invest this kind of capital and these kind of resources to be in a zero-sum game? I don't think so. So we are all about value creation. And how do we do that with the resources we get a chance to work with? Well, we spend a lot of time on the other side of the packer. So, what does that mean? You'll see that little bubble there that says PFG. That stands for Performance Food Group. They're a distribution company. Now, how many cattle feeders do you know that have a very intense relationship with a major food distribution company? We do. Again, I'm not saying it's right, but what we did is we understood what that customer is looking for in a product that they, they sell all over the country and we brought an attribute, or what we felt were a number of attributes, to the table to allow them differentiation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what some of those attributes are. But now they have a source of cattle that is building their brand. So we have broke a traditional barrier between segments. So we very much are in the meat business. We are very much in the branded beef business. And this graphic sort of shows that. Now the piece I'm going to show here affects you all. Those of you in here that are ranchers, this is the part that we as an industry can do much better with. And in the beef marketing group, we can do better as well. 
So we have in many cases, we have relationships with ranchers. There's a couple of you here in this room where we actually understand the cattle that are coming to us. But it's, it's a small, small percent. We have, uh, was said, we, we marketed last year about 650,000 cattle. And probably the ranches that I have relationship with would represent less than 10% of that. So most of our cattle come from sale barns, uh, video auctions, so on and so forth. Well, I really don't know you. I don't know you as the rancher. And more importantly, I don't know your cattle. So when we talk about opportunity and we talk about future and we talk about 2030, this bridge has to be built stronger. This bridge has to be built stronger. And you heard Tom talk about transparency. You heard him talk about traceability. You're going to hear me talk about that too in the next few minutes. But when I don't have access to the knowledge that comes with that product, those cattle, what am I going to do? I'm over here buying. We are buying anywhere between eight and 10,000 feeder cattle a week. And if I don't know, what am I going to do? I'm going to offer you guys, you gals that are ranchers, commodity prices. I can't offer you any more. And how do I define commodity in that, in this scenario? So we keep data on all of our cattle. All of our, we have millions of data points in our database. So when I look to buy feeder cattle, if you ask me, and I use this example all the time, what a six and a half weight black heifer in Alabama is worth, I can tell you. Because I fed so many of them. And I can do that if you ask me what an uh, eight weight steer in Virginia is worth. I can tell you, because I fed so many of them. But it's only based on the performance of that individual or that group of cattle not knowing any information ahead of time. I don't know if they got powerful genetics. I don't know that. I just know what my data tells me. So if I can enhance the data, a la increasing the connectivity to where the raw product comes from, we can all win. We can create more value. We can create a better, more sustainable business model. So remember that. That's a very key part of the beef marketing group, but it's probably our weakest link today. The key to some of these things when I was asked by Bob to, to identify some things that we need to probably pay attention to, need to be on our radar screen um, in 2030, is sort of understanding the thing that Wayne Gretzky said, you know, understanding where the puck is going to be. And these are really, really, uh, to me, these are things that we spend a lot of time on today. My company does. Um, Tom talked about plant-based meat, or clean meat, or fake meat. The lobbyist I mentioned to you that I spent this morning with in one of our feed yards in Great Bend, she is on point with the legislative implications that are bubbling around fake meat, and specifically how it's going to be labeled. Right? So if it comes into our grocery store here in Manhattan, Kansas, how's it going to be labeled? Is it just like hamburger? Is it going to say sterling silver? Is it going to say, what's it going to say? And we are very concerned because we want to make sure that the consumer has an honest and fair opportunity to understand what that is. And, you know, we can't use fake meat. That's a bit derogatory. And I asked her, I said, what terminology, what vernacular are you talking about today? And she's thinking about things like synthetic. She's talking things, you know, that are different, but, but won't be negative. We don't want to uh, be hurtful to any protein. We just want to be honest about what our protein is and protect our space. So I think that's a real issue. I read an article yesterday in Feedstuffs, and that article said that that product Products like this have grown 100% in one year. Now, the percent is small, albeit. But 100% growth in one year, hmm, that'll get you attention. That'll get your attention. And two weeks ago, I hosted the CEO of Tyson Fresh Meats um, in a meeting, and we were talking about what he sees as the future. So this is all of Tyson, not just beef, all of it. This is, this is on their radar. It's on their radar. Now, right now, they have a toe in the water. It's not that they're going to put a lot of resources there, but they see this as a bubbling issue we should pay attention to. So I don't know where that's going to go. I don't know. That's one we're going to pay attention to. And right now, we're really curious about how it's going to be positioned as USDA gets uh, further involved into the labeling of it. Um, blockchain. 
I think Tom maybe mentioned that. Today we, we, uh, we do a lot of transactions every day with cattle, with crops. Um, there's, there's a better, there's a better mousetrap. This may be it. I don't know enough about it to tell you, but what I hear is it has not only the opportunity to transfer funds safely and securely and confidentially, but also information. Also information. So maybe when I buy cattle from a rancher in Alabama, information comes with those cattle. Where, how, what, what medicines they got? What, what, when they were born? What's the nutrition that they're currently getting? That will help me when they come to the feed yard. So there's an opportunity to not only enhance uh, from a financial transaction opportunity, I think, but maybe information. So let's keep our eye on that one. Um, alignment, transparency, sustainability, traceability, robotics, all of those Tom mentioned, I've got a few things to touch on on each of these um, as we go through it because we are involved in a few of them. Uh, it was mentioned when I was introduced that I played a role in the development of the industry long-range plan. Well, this are the four, these were the four objectives that we came up with. Now this was in 2015. And it's already 2018, it's almost 2019. And it seems like this stuff is out of date already. So when you talk about 2030, we can't forget about the need for addressing some of these key objectives, but we already are in a place that um, the, the water is running under our bridge, and if we're not careful, our bridge is gonna get washed out. But let's talk about these just for a second. Drive growth and exports. That's where our biggest opportunity is. When we sat on the committee and we looked at data that came into us as a, as a protein, when you look at how hungry our world is and how big our world is gonna be, exports really have a greater opportunity than the domestic marketplace for our product, for, for protein, for beef. So we said, look, if you have checkoff dollars or if you have any resources, put them all over there. Let's have market access. Let's open markets. Let's create, let's take advantage of that demand for our high quality product that I know Mark probably mentioned this morning. We have the highest quality, safest product in the world. And we're, in my opinion, we're not taking advantage fully of what we could be doing. Protect, the protect and enhance the business and, and uh, political climate um, to produce our product. So that would be sort of the, let's make sure that we don't let the legislators and the regulators regulate us out of business. Let's, let's keep that, let's make sure that that continues to be a focus for the industry. Grow consumer trust. Now Tom spent a lot of time on trust, and I'm gonna spend a few minutes on trust too, so I'm not gonna address all of these and what we're trying to do, or what we think is the right and best positioning for specific strategy, but trust is a big issue. And I'm gonna show you some data that backs that up. And then uh, promote and strengthen beef's uh, value proposition. In other words, um, if, if my wife is gonna buy a beef product, I wanna make sure that she takes that away. That's a positive experience, and it's a great investment of the dollars she put into it. And we need to do more of that. We, we in some cases, uh, I think, are a little bit asleep at the wheel. When you look at what some of the other proteins are doing, and we could do a better job really emphasizing the value of that product, not only from a taste and a convenience standpoint, but from a nutritional standpoint as well. So when we look at, at, uh, at, at 2030, I think diagrams like this, we are all going to have to take very, very seriously. And all this is, is depicting a value chain. And each of us play a role in the value chain. And what we have got to do is break the barriers between each of those segments. Someone was with me this morning, this lobbyist, she was with me, and she said, it seems to me, John, there is a barrier that is there between you and the rancher. You meaning the feeder and the rancher. Wasn't picking on me specifically. And she's right. She's right. We, we butt heads on figuring out what the value of your animal is worth. I want it for less, you want to sell it for more. A natural, animostic relationship. Now why is that? Why is that? Many ranches are, they're, they're trying their hardest to improve the quality, improve the health, improve the growth, so on and so forth, of these cattle that we get. Well sometimes when I get the cattle, let's talk about condition for example. If I get a fleshy feeder animal, fleshy, you know, they're carrying condition, they don't perform as well in the feed yard. But from the rancher's perspective, that was a good thing to do because he sold more pounds off of that ranch. Well, what if we work together? 
right? And what if I said, okay, Mr. or Mrs. Rancher, why don't you work with me in the feed yard? When that animal is optimally ready to come to this phase of the growing and feeding uh, place of the, of the animal's life, do that. Let's do that. Let's consider your forage. Let's consider the end product. Let's consider the efficiency of the entire animal. That's where we've got to break these barriers because as long as we have that kind of thing and the market signals we're getting, we're going to butt heads. And you know what? In the pork industry, they don't butt heads. In the poultry industry, they don't butt heads. I'm not saying we're going to be a pork or a poultry industry, but three weeks ago, I had the number two guy at Smithfield riding around with me. He is the current chairman of the U.S. Meat Export Federation, and he asked me, because I sit on a committee with him, he asked me, could I ever come out and see your operation? I'd like to understand cattle feeding a little bit. I said, heck yeah, because I want the reciprocal. I want to go learn a little bit about his business. He told me, Smithfield, Smithfield has... Um, they, uh, they are responsible for 18% of all the pork in the United States, one company. 18% doesn't sound like to y'all, maybe it's a lot, it's a, it's a bunch of pigs. S but, but what was amazing to me, he told me that from a genetic standpoint, he has 15 boars that are the entire genetic pool for 17% of all the hogs produced in the United States. Hmm. 15 boars. Now they must be a good boar, you know? And the other thing is, he makes all the boars. So he didn't buy them from anybody else. But I am just put that into contrast to what we deal with, right? I could tell you in our feed yards in the last 10 years, we have got a lot blacker. Now that's because that's being driven by the end user and good producers like you heard from this morning that are making great genetics. But I got a lot of colored cattle, and I got a lot of this and of that, and the soup to nuts, really, at the end of the day. Compared to my competition, I look at my competition as really those that play in the protein space, and pork is one of them. 15 boars for 17% of the entire production that they make, that they generate out of Smithfield. We gotta get working closer together. We gotta break those barriers. Okay. A vision of the beef industry 2030, a lot of changes. There's changes in the market, changes in the consumer, and changes in society. I'm going to touch just a little bit on a couple of those. So let's talk a minute about uh, people. I mentioned this when we started. You have heard these numbers many times, and I don't profess to be <laughs> um, a, a research expert at all, but some of these numbers are very compelling, and we've got to pay attention to them, right? This, this, uh, this globe is growing at an exponential rate. And not only that, the middle class is coming up globally. So we go from lower class to middle class. You know what happens when that happens? They have a chance to buy protein. We are the best protein there is. What are we going to do about that? How are we going to address these signals? We better be prepared for this. And there's a great opportunity, especially for us, because we produce a high quality product. Who are they and what do they expect? Now let's talk just a little bit about millennials. I, it took me a year and a half to be able to say that word. So I'm not going to talk a lot about them, but they fit into this class is age 1981 to 1996. And I see a lot of you in here that fit into this class. Well, they're moving their prime spent, they're moving into the age when they have money to spend. Do we really know how to talk to them? Do we really know what they want? Well, I'm going to tell you, they're telling us things that they want. And it has to do with social media. It has to do with Facebook, which I don't even play in. And I should, shame on me. That's where, they, that's where this consumer is going to be. That's where they're going to live. Now, the point here I want you to, to, to understand is they are looking online for what their fellow consumers are saying. That's where they get, those are the influencers. That, that medium is. And then they look elsewhere to validate it. Now you're going to hear me talk a little bit about validation because trust, we talked about that a minute ago, trust is rare, really, really important to these buying decisions of these millennials and the other younger generation, X and others that are coming right behind them. Trust. This, this came from um, uh, Maiden Marketing. Big marketing firm, does a lot of work in consumer uh, protein, pro consumer food, food um, uh, research. So in 2017, 
we had 55% uh, believe farm animals are treated humanely. In one year, it, it went down from 61% just one year earlier. Now, why is this important? Humane treatment. These people, these people I tell you about, they're making decisions based on these kinds of attributes. So we better take care of our animals. This is becoming a really, really driving force for our company. And it's not just that we, we have always prided ourselves on taking care of our animals, but now we're going to have to prove it. We're going to have to validate it. We're going to have to score it. We're going to have to get better at it. Just saying that we do it is not good enough. That's the point. Just saying that we do it is not good enough. Transparency is taking on a whole new color. It's not just saying, okay, here comes, open up my kimono, that's it. Nope, now you're going to have to validate. Now you're going to have to verify, you're going to have to prove, and you're going to have to reprove to get this consumer, this consumer satisfied that we are comfortable purchasing your protein and we're comfortable purchasing more of it. I mentioned transparency, Tom mentioned transparency, so I don't want to be redundant, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take more. And, and this quote came in here from, uh, from the CEO of Maiden Marketing, and I really believe it. A brand is no longer what you tell the customer. It is what the customer is telling each other. It's a very different, when, you, when you're in the marketing game, that's a very different challenge to take on. So how do you get the customer to talk positively about your product? That becomes a question. Versus us telling them how good our stuff is, how do we get them to talk about it in a positive way? Society is increasingly skeptical, and there's lots of reasons for that. We have a, we have a world of, of question. I'm not going to go into specifics, but a story will not be enough anymore. We talk about storied beef, right? And there is a number of brands that have been very successful at that. That we got the blue skies, we got the green grass, we got the cowboy and the pretty family, and so on and so forth. That ain't going to be enough anymore. We are actually going to have to get more ro robust about that. And we can, we, uh, um, what I call associative marketing will no longer, in my opinion, pass the litmus test. So if we put a picture of your beautiful family up there and say we raise these beautiful cattle and put that on a retail case, the consumer is pretty soon going to say, okay, I want his cattle. I just don't want his image or her cattle or that family's cattle. So we're going to have to figure out a way to get those cattle that are represented that way into the meat case so that it's one and the same, my opinion. Okay. Um, again, Maiden Marking, I'm, I just, I, I've recently been involved with them in a couple of things, and they will tell you that 86% of the millennial moms will pay more for food with full transparency. All right, and so these are things, I'm not, I'm not a fan or a cheerleader for these attributes, but these are the kinds of things that they're looking for with full transparency, minimally processed, GMO free. Was the worker who produced the food treated fairly? Was the animal treated fairly and humanely? What about the environmental sensitivity that was around the landscape that that protein was produced on? Is it ethically sourced? Now, I'll tell you, my dad, who I'm a, I'm a second generation, he, he would have never bothered with any of this. In 2030, these may become the rules of which we operate by. I want to talk a little bit about sustainability, only because it is, it is a real movement on a number of levels. And this is no more or less than a graph of a pilot project that our company is involved with, with a few other companies, to take a, a, a framework of sustainability and try to apply it in a real world setting. So when you talk about sustainability and you talk about things like water, let's call them an indicator. Because there's, there's basically six or 10 different indicators that we all operate under. But let's take one for example, and how can we, as a supply chain, or as a value chain, um, address something like water? So let's say you're a rancher and you've got a grazing management plan. That's one way. That's you at the ranch. 
Let's say that I'm a feed yard and I've got a lagoon and, those, and that runoff water goes on to my farm and so on and so forth. And let's say I'm a packer and I'm trying to use water to disassemble these animals, but then I want to reuse the water where I can and there's so much steams used and so on and so forth. And then let's say I'm a retailer like McDonald's and there's water that's used to produce the hamburgers that you and I enjoy. Some of you may not enjoy McDonald's hamburgers, but I do, but there's water. So how do we tie, how do we connect the dots? all the way through the value chain. And I'm just taking one, one variable, one indicator, water. So we have put together a pilot project which involves cattle. You heard when I was introduced that I'm involved with the Noble Research Institute. They do a lot of consulting work with a lot of ranches. So we got those ranches cattle. We actually bought the cattle at the Beef Marketing Group. They came to Kansas. We fed the cattle. So we're measuring the water at the ranch. Then we're going to measure the water at the feed yard. Then we're going to, and we're going to try to compare, and we're going to try to learn and benchmark how can we do better. Because sustainability is important. Why is it important? Because if you go to Bentonville, Arkansas, how many know what is in Bentonville, Arkansas? It's, it's, a, big old, it's a big old deal. It's an 800-pound gorilla. And they are absolutely passionate about sustainability. So if we think for a minute, when I come to producer meetings and I talk about sustainability, you know what happens first thing? Uh, the eyes get glazed over. Like, oh my God, when it becomes important, John, tell me about it, right? Well, I'm telling you here today, this is important. And this, this model that we've got, this pilot project that I'm giving you an exhibit up here, it, it, it is nothing more than an opportunity to learn. We don't have it solved. We're trying to figure out, can we play in this space? And if so, what can we learn and how can we become better? So this is a, this, d don't, don't get glazy eyes when this, when this term comes up. It's real. And Walmart and Wendy's and McDonald's and HEB and Kroger, they're all going to be pushing for it. They're publicly traded companies and they're getting consumer pressure around being more sustainable as a company. So now that's filtering down to their supply chains, to their value chains, and we are in that category. So this is, this is real, and there may be opportunity. There may be real opportunity here, because if we do it right, maybe sustainability turns into we can be more efficient than we thought we are, if we learn, if we benchmark, and if we're committed to continual improvement. We, as a company, we, uh, this, is a, this is a point about alignment. We as a company about uh, five years ago got real concerned when uh, LFTB happened. Everybody knows LFTB is a, it's a finely trimmed, something that people call it pink slime. And so what happened, uh, there was a sen sensationalized article that came out, media picked it up, went viral, and pretty soon this product that was absolutely sanitary, absolutely safe, absolutely healthy, got taken away from us. And it was taken totally out of context and it got taken away from us. So it, I, don't, or no, I don't own the company, I don't participate in the company, but if you look at the whole value chain, that got taken away from us. So it cost all of us, it cost you and me, every one of us. We got concerned as cattle feeders that, hey, there could be a next one of those. And how, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna sit around and, and, and wait? Maybe it's antibiotics. Maybe it is antibiotics. There's a lot of concern around antibiotics. And so shouldn't we learn about antibiotics and resistance and so on and so forth to protect our opportunity to either use that technology or get rid of it for the right reason, but we're gonna have to kind of learn about it. We're gonna have to kind of get in front of it. And so what we did is we got together with some fellow cattle feeders. Those are the logos up at the top. And we felt like that if we got together with six or seven of us, we'd have enough cattle that we represent that we could actually do something with a small group. It wouldn't be a room, full, it's not an association, it would be a room full of people. It's a small group, but we have like-mindedness around concerns that are facing our business. Those companies up there represent about 27% of the fed cattle in the United States. And what we started doing is started saying, okay, can we together as cattle feeders do some things that address these potential concerns that are coming? So we started, we invited a bunch of retailers to a meeting like this. We had 25 retailers representing a huge percent of the, of the uh, uh, use of our product, from, from McDonald's to uh, Yum's, which is Taco Bell, to Walmart. To, we just had a bunch of them. And we said, look, we are cattle feeders, and this is what we're, we, we became transparent. We said, this is what we're doing. Tell us what we should be doing better. And they, you know, some of their responses were 
pretty interesting. They said, look, don't expect us at the end user level to defend your product. That's, that's a hard message because we're trying to do the best thing we can. And that's our customer, our indirect customer. Don't expect us to defend your product. So we say, okay, how does that look? And they said, well, you know what? You, there's, there's, there's all this looseness around some of the things that go into producing cattle. So we started taking some of the information we knew over the last five years and sharing it with them. We, have, we are producing 13% 13 more, 13 more product over this last 30 years. We have 13, excuse me, we have uh, 13 fewer animals. We're using 30% less land, and we got 20% less feed. That's because we have evolved. That's because we are trying to be sustainable as a business. These kinds of messages they never had had before. And yet we are 25% of the fed cattle that can, so we're a relevant number of their business. And when we start telling the story, it starts to make a difference. Again, the key message here is alignment. We got to have these kind of communications with those who are using and destroying and utilizing our product. I, I don't mean to see destroy, but they're, they're, they're taking it from the packer and, and from the end user and consuming it. That group, we made a commitment to five pillars. And again, these, anybody could do this. We kind of got some smart um, journalists together and said, what, what would that look like? And these are the things that we committed to. Um, oversight, veterinary oversight. Veterinarian holds as high a reputation in the consumer marketplace as a priest. So we're going to utilize that. We're going to utilize that credibility. We're committing to traceability. We're committing to, and, and so every animal that we treat, we fully trace um, from the feed yard all the way through. We're going to use a documented animal welfare program. We're no longer going to be able to say we are committed to um, animal care and BQA. Now we're going to prove it. We're still committed to it, but now we're going to verify it and validate it. And we're going to commit to judicious and responsible use of technologies, including antibiotics. And we're going to show them. We're going to be transparent. We're going to show them the records. We're going to show them how we take care of the cattle. We're going to show them how we take care of the bottles of medicine that we have in our medicine checks. That kind of education will help build the trust that we are losing. I only got two more slides. This one here, this six through one, this is our approach to responsible antibiotics use in beef. Okay, you know who this is? You know who wrote this? McDonald's. This is McDonald's. This is not a cattle feeder. This is not a rancher. This is McDonald's writing antibiotic policy on live cattle. And most of it is really good. And most of it, we have collaborated with them to write and to draft so they understand. But you take McDonald's as a global company, they have, they have influence from Europe and other countries that don't use antibiotics. So they look at us and say, well, can't you do that? And we're different. We're in a different region. And we operate differently, and we, and we have different resources. So we have had to have discussions, but it's, it's hard to argue with alignment with pro progressive pro producers. They want to do that. So we got to put our hand out and say, OK, come with us. Let's walk together. A focused approach, absolutely. We've got to be able to make a difference. We got to do pilot tests. So they want to understand how we use the technologies, specifically here, antibiotics. And then they want to benchmark. And they, want, they expect continual improvement. Now, continual improvement does not necessarily mean reduction, but that's what they want. And so we got to expect that. We are going to have to get real about metaphylaxis treatment on high-risk cattle, for example. And if that is strange terminology for you, I'm sorry. We deal with cattle that are high-risk. They come in, and a few of them are sick, so we're going to have to treat all of them. That's going to be a challenge in the future based on this kind of feedback, right? Look at that last point. Leverage our scale for good. So the way I interpret that, way well, you could interpret that, because they're a big 800-pound gorilla, we could have some leverage happening to us. This is going to happen way before 2030. We are going to have to collaborate with our end users on a grander scale than we are today. Everybody recognize this? This is a Wendy's cheeseburger. This is Wendy's antibiotic policy. So Wendy's, and they've actually been here on this campus and made a presentation around their animal welfare policy. 
and they are committed. You'll, yeah, I don't need to read this with you, but you can read through there that they are getting closer to their supply. That's the message. And we better be ready for that, and I think there's a great opportunity. When I say better be ready for it, I don't mean that to be a threat. These are great people. They are smart people, and they want to feed their customers. And we got the best product to do that, but we need to get closer to them. We need to help them, and the opportunity is there. Again, we all need to kind of skate to where the puck is. We can't be satisfied with where we are today, where we were yesterday, or where we're going to be next week. We need to be thinking five years from now, because this thing is, is, it is fast. It is a big swoosh. Thank you for letting me come and share with you some of my thoughts here this afternoon. Again, take them with a grain of salt. Take all of them with a grain of salt. It's only my opinion. And, uh, and Bob, I hope I wasn't too, uh, too far out there on some of my comments. So thank you very much.